God's people said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Please take your Bibles and turn to that portion of Scripture which we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 3 and verses 9 through 12. We've been in this passage for four weeks, and then we broke from Memorial Day and talked about a divine memorial, which is actually at the end of that text there. And then, of course, last Sunday was Communion Sunday, and so we spoke about the cross and sanctification. So now we're back to our text in Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 through 12. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings on your word, that as it goes forth it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. Your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We pray, Father, that you will use your word this day to expose what is in our hearts, that you will bring to our attention the sin that is there, that you will convict us of it, that you will bring us to true repentance and to true walk of faith. Thank you, Father, once again for this your word, and we pray for your blessings upon it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that as we left off that passage three weeks ago, we learned several very important lessons about God's call on Moses' life. God is here singling Moses out for a very specific and very special task. If you are a believer, God has singled you out for a very specific and special task as well. You have responsibilities before the living God, things that someday you will give an account for. If you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will give an account, but it will be a very grim and sad account. Your name will not be found written in the book of life. You will be cast into the lake of fire. But if you are a believer... You will give an account for the things that you've done in this body, whether good or bad, whether for the glory of Christ or in disobedience to that which he has called you to do. He has revealed in his word precisely what he wants you to do. He revealed to Moses exactly what he wanted Moses to do, and you and I have greater revelation than Moses had. We have the entire New Testament. We are post-cross. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit who gives us understanding and illumination. The Holy Spirit who never leaves us and will never leave us throughout our entire life. We can grieve him, we can quench him, but he will abide with us forever, as Jesus said, even the Spirit of truth. We have, therefore, great responsibility. Now, I'm going to take lesson number 10, which we studied three weeks ago, and I want to expand on it today because there are many who feel, especially in reform circles, that somehow by keeping the law, they're going to gain favor with God, whether for salvation or sanctification. Both of those are heretical directions to take. And yet I find it very prevalent in many of the things that I read. And so we need to understand and recognize that doing the will of God is not merely keeping the Ten Commandments but it is serving God from the heart. Now, we covered that three weeks ago, but I want to go into a lot more detail on that issue today, the Lord willing. God was going to use Moses to give the law to Israel, but when God called Moses, he had not yet given the Ten Commandments. And even when God gave the law to Israel, they had a heart of stone and had pagan gods in their hearts. 
And we've covered that much in the book of Acts on Sunday evenings. But God promised that there was a day coming where he was going to give them one heart and put a new spirit within them and take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. A new heart also will I give you, says Ezekiel, Ezekiel 26, 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. How much different is stone from flesh? How much more living is flesh than stone? How much harder is it to penetrate a stone than it is to penetrate flesh? You know, I recently saw a book for sale by a Dutchman, the title of which was The Ten Commandments, God's Rule Book for the Christian Life. I don't know if that strikes you as kind of strange, but friends, that borders on the Galatian heresy. Putting believers back under the law. Where do we ever find Jesus or Paul telling believers, listen guys, don't you know what you're supposed to do? Whip out your copy of the Ten Commandments and get your act together. You never find that in the New Testament. Now I understand nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated or restated anyway in the New Testament, though the Sabbath commandment is not. But they are restated on an entirely different basis than the law given to Moses at Mount Sinai. The old basis was God's covenant of holy judgment and death. It was a covenant of death. It says so in the New Testament. A holy judgment and death covenant with national Israel at Mount Sinai, if they failed to obey, God would kill them. That is not the basis for our obedience to Christ today. That if we don't get our act together according to the Ten Commandments, God is going to kill us. Do you not remember what happens at Mount Sinai? They had to put a barricade around the mountain as Moses went up to get the law. And if even a beast would cross the barricade, it would be killed and thrust through with a dart. And the people shook and trembled and fled from the mountain when God came down and it shook and rumbled. It was a covenant of holy death and holy judgment. Paul explains it in Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, and then again in 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The connection between the law and sin and death. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The passage that we always read at funerals has that statement in it, 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. When we're dealing with with the law, we're dealing with God's holy righteousness, we're dealing with his judgment against sin, we're dealing with death, not life. We serve a holy God, he will judge sin. Those who violate his law demonstrate they are sinners and on their way to hell. But that is not our basis as believers for serving God. The basis we have as believers for serving the God is, is our righteousness that is imputed to us through Christ. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. And by the way, that means a far higher standard than ever could be obtained or demanded by the Old Testament law. Jesus explained it. He says, you know, the Old Testament law said, you know, not to lust. Hey, or... or if you commit adultery, don't commit adultery. But, you know, I say if you lust after a woman, you've already committed adultery in, her, in your heart with her. You know, the Old Testament law said, you know, don't steal. But I'm telling you that if you covet, you've already committed theft. It's a lot higher standard. People, we cannot keep God's law. Certainly not in the flesh. You cannot. It only condemns you. But now you have a new relationship with Christ. Paul gives four different illustrations of that in Romans chapter 6. He talks about death. He talks about resurrection. He talks about slavery. 
and he talks about marriage to explain our new relationship to Christ and therefore our freedom from being under the law because we have a relationship with the one who has fulfilled the law. Righteousness comes to us because Christ has perfectly fulfilled the law, not because we have fulfilled the law. We have a new relationship that makes us free from the law. It's empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it is portrayed in our new marriage union with Christ. Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He knows there are going to be people who say, well, you know, if we're not under the law, if the Ten Commandments isn't our rule but for life, then we're going to be free to sin. Paul says, no, you don't get it. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, and here's the first illustration, is death. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, death separates. Death breaks old unions. Death breaks bonds. Were you a million dollars in debt? You died? You're going to have to worry about that million dollars anymore? Somebody else might have to worry about it, but you sure don't. You're dead to it. You no longer owe that money. Were you about to receive a million dollars inheritance and you died? You know what? You don't get it. Death breaks it from the realm of the living. That's the first illustration that he uses here to show that we are no longer under the law. And sin, which is that sting that has its strength from the law, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15 just a moment ago, no longer has dominion over you. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. That's Paul's argument here in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Still answering that same argument. Somebody's going to say, well, but, but that means that I can go out there and sin as much as I want to sin. No, it does not. Being under grace is not being a libertine. Being under grace does not mean that God does not have standards. Being under grace now means you have a new empowerment and a new relationship so that you can do what you could not do before. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? Here's his second illustration. The illustration of slavery. His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see, grace doesn't give you the right to go out and sin all that you want. The Apostle Paul counters that and he says, there's some that say that that's what we're teaching. Oh no. What I'm teaching, says Paul, is I'm teaching that you now have a new empowerment, a new desire to live a life that's pleasing to God, which you never could do before in the flesh. Certainly you could not do it by trying to keep the letter of the law. And then he moves on from that illustration of slavery to the illustration of marriage. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Dead to the law by the body of Christ. And then he talks about resurrection. You see, when you die, if you're a believer, you go directly to be with Christ. But someday there's going to be a resurrection of your body. The body that you're living in right now will die if the Lord tarries. It will probably, if unless there's some kind of a national catastrophe, be taken by somebody, either loved ones or the state, and put into a casket and dropped into a hole in the ground. You'll be buried. But there is coming a day when all the dead are going to rise and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And, and we're going to have resurrection bodies. You know what? And they are never going to sin again. When you are in your resurrection body, you are free from all those temptations of the world. You're free from all the sinful carnal things that you've done in the past. 
You're going to have a perfect body that will never die again. So Paul ties that together with the issue here of marriage. And he says, you, you were like married to the law at one time, but you died. Sin killed you. But now you're getting to get raised again, and now you're being married to Christ. The Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 7, in the first three verses, that when someone dies, the widow is free to remarry without committing adultery. Marriage while the former spouse is still alive is the commission of an adultery. But when death has separated that marriage bond, the living spouse is free to be married to another. That's Romans 7, 1, 2, and 3. You can look at it for yourself. Here he's explaining that death has separated us from the old manner of life and from being under the law, and now we are married to Christ. It's a new relationship. It's a personal relationship. It's an intimate relationship. It's a relationship based on love, not on law. And it is our desire to do everything we can to please our heavenly bridegroom. How much different from that is the thundering and smoking of Mount Sinai where even if a beast thrust through the fence around it, it was to be put to death. The marriage relationship, the most beautiful and perfect picture of our relationship to Christ and his bride, the church. That is what Paul is explaining here. We are dead to the law by the body of Christ that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. What is a marriage relationship supposed to produce? It produces children, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And there should be spiritual children because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, that his spirit working in us and through us should with excitement be reaching the world for Christ. Bring forth fruit. That's what Paul is talking about here in that context. And then the very next verse in Romans 7, 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. You have a new indwelling Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of you and now empowers you with life to do what you could not do when you were dead. Dear people, do not be caught up. It's, it's a very popular thing in reform circles to be always moving back to the Ten Commandments. But recognize that it's not the covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai that motivates us to serve Christ and to do right but a new life and relationship as we are married to Christ in the body of Christ. We serve him out of love. Oh, how different those two pictures are. You say, well, it all comes out the same in the end in the wash. No, it doesn't. You can live a life of fear and trepidation, a life of always trying to keep the jots and the tittles, a life of always being, checking back to see whether this is one of the Ten Commandments or not, or can you get away with it. Or you can live a joyful life of a relationship. Think of the newly married young couple walking along the beach hand in hand, their hearts and their eyes filled with love for the other. Absolutely no desire to do anything that would harm that other one, always being sensitive to the wishes of the one whom they love. Those are two different pictures. And you can live your life in fear and trepidation or you can live your life in holy love for the one who loved you and gave himself for you. It's a difference. It's a genuine difference. But Paul goes on in verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. You see, the law does demonstrate holiness. The law does demonstrate sin. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And lust is, of course, lusting after someone who is not yours. You're coveting. 
sin taking occasion by the commandment, thou shalt not covet, he's talking about the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, that's evil desires, inordinate desires. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, there was nothing to condemn me. There was no judge that sat there and said, you're guilty, therefore you must die. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, here we are, back to the Ten Commandments, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. I thought this was the way that I'm going to live. And he said, I discovered instead that it was the commandment that caused me to die. You see, the Ten Commandments, as given at Mount Sinai, was God's holy covenant of death to demonstrate that there is none righteous, no, not one. It's not the way of salvation. It's not the way of sanctification. It is the demonstration that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Ecclesiastes, as Solomon proclaims it. And then he goes on. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Did you see the contrast he gave there in Romans 8.2? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's a relationship. That's your position. That's where you are if you are a believer. You are in Christ Jesus. It's a new relationship. And he contrasts that with the law of sin and death. You see, the Ten Commandments deal with sin. The Ten Commandments deal with death. Because you cannot keep the law. Certainly not in the flesh. But when you're walking in the Spirit, when you are walking by faith, the Holy Spirit gives you the direction and many other things besides the Ten Commandments so that you can live a life that is pleasing to God, which you could not do by yourself. Paul explains that the law is good. But he also explains the context in which the law is good. He writes to young Timothy, and he does not say the law is good for salvation. He does not say it's for sanctification. He does not tell Timothy that the law is the rule book for Christian living. Listen to what he says is the purpose of the law. It's not the rule book for Christian living. Listen what it is. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Do you want to know what God's purpose in your life is? what the ultimate goal and direction is, he says it's three things. It's charity out of a pure heart. Charity is agape. That's the word for God's kind of love. God is trying to produce in you his kind of love. The end of, a command, of the commandment is love out of a pure heart. And the second thing, and of a good conscience. Did you know the law will never cleanse your, cleanse your conscience? It will never purge your conscience. Paul explains that in Romans, excuse me, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The law could never purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. It is the blood of Christ that purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, charity out of a pure heart, good conscience. Number three, Faith unfeigned. What that means is genuine faith. That's God's ultimate goal for you in your Christian life, is love out of a pure heart, good conscience, faith unfeigned. The law will never produce any of those things. And then he explains what has happened, where it says, For some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law. He's giving us a contrast, folks. Desiring to be teachers of the law. 
understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. Now, Paul is not telling us that the law is bad. In fact, the next verse tells us the law is good. But he tells us when it's good and in what context it's good. Listen to him. Verse 8, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. There is a lawful use of the law, there is an unlawful use of the law. What is the lawful use? He explains, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Do you see where that is in contrast to the title of that book? Ten Commandments, God's rule book for Christian living. The law is not made for a righteous man. The law is not made for a righteous man. If you've trusted Christ, you are righteous in Christ, you are seen in Him, His righteousness has been imputed to your account. The law condemns sin. Now, if you as a sinner sin, you will be chastened for it by your loving Heavenly Father. He doesn't let His kids get away with sin. What shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, first illustration, dead to sin, live any longer therein? The law is not made for a righteous man, but it tells us what is the lawful use of it. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, that's sodomites, for men stealers, that's people who kidnap and sell slaves, for liars, for perjured persons. You lying on the stand? Try that with God. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Covers all the heresies and all the different apostasies in that last phrase. Any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That's what the law is made for. It condemns the wicked. But it is not made for a righteous man. It's not your means of salvation. It's not your means of sanctification. It is not your rule book for Christian living. The Apostle Paul explains that the way we are to live is because of our new love relationship with Christ. Back there in Romans chapter 7 again, we left off at verse 10, where he said that the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. He continues in verse 11, explaining the purpose of the commandments. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. Don't go out of here and say something that I didn't say. I am not saying the law is bad. I'm saying the law has to be used for the purpose God intended it used. Not for all the other purposes that people cloud your minds with. Because the law is holy, and just, and good. But then Paul goes on in verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But that sin, that it might appear sin. God has a holy standard which demonstrates what sin is. And if what you do doesn't match up to that holy standard, it's sin. We're going to talk about sin in a second. Because although the um, catechism includes some of the parts of what sin is. It doesn't include all of them, and sometimes we tend to forget the other parts. We'll talk about that in just a second. That, the, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Why? Because it says, it's working death in me by that which is good. It's like the perfect standard if you want to live. Can you live by keeping the perfect standard? Orthodox Jews try it and have for centuries. I mean, they go to the very minutia, 639 hedges about the law, all the little minutia commandments to make sure that you don't break the big ones. And they try so hard to keep them. And they wear the little boxes on their foreheads and they tie the things around their wrists and they wear the prayer shawls. And on the Sabbath day, which by the way is Saturday, not Sunday, on the Sabbath day they wear sneakers when they're going to synagogue to make sure that the nail in the heel of the shoe would not strike a flint and cause a spark, and thus they've lighted a fire on the Sabbath day. Dear people, you will wear yourself out if you try to do that, and you will never please God. Never. Because that's 
not what pleases God. The standard is to prove that you are a sinner. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans 7.14 Now let's talk about sin for a minute. So we understand what happens when we as believers sin. Do we lose our salvation? No, we do not lose our salvation. Do we get out of fellowship? Yes, we definitely get out of fellowship. If we don't repent and confess it as sin, are we going to come under the chastening hand of God? Yes, we are. But let's talk about sin for a second. Missing the mark is what the word sin means, amartion. means to miss the mark. We can miss the mark by overshooting. We can miss the mark by undershooting. If you had a bow and arrow and you shot, you could fall short of that mark. Or you might shoot and the arrow would go beyond the mark. In any case, you've missed the mark. You might go off to the right, you might go off to the list, left. But you haven't hit the mark, the target, the bullseye. So it's missing the mark either by undershooting, which is failing to live up to divine righteousness, which all of us fail to do, or overshooting, that is, and especially cultic groups, require that which God does not require for righteousness. You think about all the things that probably you're most familiar with is the Church of Rome. All the penances and the scapulars and all of the confessions to a priest and the pilgrimages to Rome and wearing the beads and doing the rosaries. And all of these other things to somehow gain righteousness. Saying that you will gain righteousness through some man-made commandment. That's missing the mark too. That's overshooting it. That's requiring something that God does not require to gain righteousness and to get into heaven. From the Catechism, we know the first two parts of the definition of sin. 1 John 3, 4 is the first verse that is given. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. We've already seen how Paul ties the law and sin together. The law condemns sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. That's 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. So whenever someone does something that is contrary to the law of God, which includes more than the Ten Commandments, when they do something that is contrary to the law of God, they have sinned. That we understand. 1 John 5.17 says, All unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin not unto death. There are different categories of sins. Some of them you're going to die because you've committed them. But all unrighteousness is sin. If it's not righteous, that is if it does not have the positive characteristics of righteousness, righteousness deals with those things that are good works in God's sight. There are three tests for good works in the sight of God. It must be done in obedience to the word of God. It must be done to the glory of God. It must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. If you miss any one of those three, you don't have it. Oh yes, we do something obeying the word of God. We're saying it's to the glory of God. But you know what? If it was done in the power of the flesh, it wasn't to the glory of God. So you miss two of them right off the bat. Even if you mechanically did the right thing. All unrighteousness is sin. Paul explains in Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his fight, sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You can keep the law perfectly, but you know what? By the deeds of the law shall there no flesh be justified in his sight. That's what Paul says. You can never be declared righteous in the sight of God, which is what the word justification means, to be declared righteous. You can never be declared righteous in the sight of God by keeping the law. James 2.9 But if you have respect of persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. You see, sin and the law are tied together. The second part that's given in the Catechism um, deals with the absence of righteousness, not merely the transgression of the law. James 4.17 Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
If you knew the right thing to do and you chose not to do it, that's sin. Not only sins of commission, but sins of omission. But there is a very important part that is not referenced in the Catechism. Sin is deeper than that. Sin also includes everything that is not of faith. Not merely transgression of the law or lack of conformity with the law. Everything that is not of faith. Romans 14, 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. Now listen to the last phrase. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We've been called not only to walk in a love relationship with Christ, but we've been called to walk by faith in that relationship. You've all known marriages whereby just out of a sense of duty, or we might say out of a sense of law, because it's the right thing to do, a wife has gone along with her husband, or a husband's gone along with a domineering wife. And they've hung in there with that marriage perhaps 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 100 years, centuries ago. They've hung in there. But there was no love relationship. They just did it because you're supposed to do it. There have also been those who have gone along but haven't really trusted their leadership. Wives who are always pulling and crying and whimpering about the leadership that the husband is giving. They're not walking with him by faith and trusting God to work through their leadership. You know, God established, by the way, just throw this in here, God established the husband as the leader in the home, not the wife, not the kids. God ordained the man to be in charge. A lot of pressure on you men. Don't pass the buck to your wife. But the wives are supposed to obey their husbands and submit to them by faith. And they pray for their husbands that God will give the husband wisdom to give the right direction. And then they can, by faith and with joy, recognize the weight falls on his shoulders and they can follow along and trust God to work through their husband. You see, it fits this pattern here too because whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's the key to all of Scripture. Not the Ten Commandments, but a love relationship where there's the walk of faith. That's the heart of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. Don't let someone pull you into the Galatian error. Are you in the heritage of the Reformation? I am. I hope you are. The just shall live by faith. Not by the law. By faith. It doesn't mean that you will live a profligate life. What shall we sin? The grace may abound. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's a new relationship. It's a relationship of love. It's a walk of faith trusting the living God. And walking in peace and joy with Him day by day. Renewed by the Spirit of God living in you. And doing things that are well pleasing in His sight. Not because of a covenant at Sinai. But because you are related to Christ through faith. Oh, how many passages there are. I see our time has already passed. And I'm only halfway through. It always happens, doesn't it? I get to preaching instead of following my notes. <laughs> well, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You see, doing the will of God is not mechanical. It's not rote. It's not mindless obedience. It's a matter of obeying his will from the heart. Not with eye services, men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Ephesians 6, 6. 2 Corinthians 3, 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now look, he's going to go back to Ten Commandments here. Listen to this last half of this verse. Not in tables of stone but in fleshly tables of the heart. 
heart doesn't respond to love. Or excuse me, stone does not respond to love, but the heart can respond to love. Stone has little picky details written on it. The heart says, I want to go beyond that. How can I please you in other ways? Not just doing the bare minimum. A wife who loves her husband will not merely wait for him to say, now make my breakfast. And then she stands there and he says, what I mean is scramble me some eggs. So she scrambles eggs. He says, and now I want you to pour me a glass of orange juice. So she pours him a glass of orange juice. And now what I want you to do is put a plate on the table and put the food on the plate. Now please make me a sausage. Now please bring me a bowl of cereal. What kind of a relationship would that be? Love goes beyond what the bare minimum of the law requires. And you are in a love relationship with Christ if you have trusted him. You are in a relationship whereby you can walk by faith, knowing that what he chooses for you is best, even when the waters look troubled, even when the storm clouds arise on the horizon, even when the night descends and you're in the wilderness. You have hold of the hand of the one who said, I am the light of the world. You're walking with him. You're not walking in darkness. You follow his path and you never are in danger. Oh, dear people, remember your love relationship with Christ. Remember the heart of the Reformation. The just shall live by faith. Not merely come alive, but will live by faith. Day by day walk. Walking by faith. Walking in the Spirit. Walking in the light. And you'll find that you're pleasing to your Heavenly Father. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your wonderful, lovely, beautiful word. Please, Father, keep us from being minimalists who only do the bare minimum that we're commanded to do. Help us to be those who love and who want to do as much as we possibly can to serve you with every moment of our lives, not wasting it, not parsing it as to whether or not it fits under one of the Ten Commandments, but because we love Christ, we want to serve Him, we want to walk with Him, we want to be with Him in His presence at all times. We want to walk by faith. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and use it in a way that most perfectly glorifies yourself, for it is your word, and you've promised that it will not return void. And so we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 132, Join All the Glorious Names of Wisdom, Love, and Power. Let's stand to sing number 132.